Hi, everybody. Hi, Pam. Hi, guys. I'm Pam. <laughs> In case you haven't already met me, I work for Microsoft. I'm the director of identity standards at Microsoft, and I have the best job in the world. I get to work with incredibly smart people who care about the tiny details of how the internet works every single day. Uh, we do a ton of traveling. We get to uh, attend international uh, meetings in order to basically argue about whether something should be base64 encoded or base64 URL encoded, right? So if this is the kind of thing that you like and you get excited about, oh, then uh, the world of standards might be for you. Uh, so it's detail-oriented, but it's also got a huge impact, which is super fun. Um, my background is in identity management for a long, long time. So if you guys were here for the intro, um, right from directories in 1996 all the way through web access management, all of that good stuff um, has been the stuff that I get to play with every day. Um, but I want to talk about a topic that is, are we good? Yes. Look at that, seamless. Oh, there's more people coming in. Those of you who have spare open seats, can you put your hands up again? There, okay, there you go. There's one up front, there's a couple right up here. Perfect. All right, so what I wanna talk about today is probably the least popular topic in all of identity management because it has never ever properly worked across domains, and that is session management. So, uh, in 1996, I got to spend four months in Russia. Uh, it was a, an exchange program where I exchanged quite a bit of money to go and live with Russian families. And when I was there, I was in St. Petersburg. Uh, if any of you have never been to the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, it is incredible. It's, uh, you know, it, it was built in a building built by the Tsar. It is five football fields long. And what is inside the Hermitage are literally a thousand or two thousand little tiny rooms, because of course it was built you know, way back when big rooms never happened. Little tiny rooms stuffed with art. I mean, literally you walk into one room and there's 25 Rembrandts and they're like beside each other, right? I mean, it's, it's a horrible way in some ways to display art, but it's just a shocking display of how much uh, beauty there is. Um, but all of these little tiny rooms, uh, you know, if you put yourself in the, the shoes of the security people who are trying to secure access to this resource, which are these rooms and rooms full of art. What do you do? How do you keep that art safe? How do you prevent somebody from walking up to something and punching it, or ripping it, or backing into it, or knocking it over? Well, what they did, at least in 1996, is they used people. They used manpower for this. And so in every single one of those tiny little rooms, was for the most part, and mostly because it's Russia, not you know, um, for probably for many reasons, but often were little tiny old ladies would sit in these corners, and they would just sit there. They would be very very quiet, and if you got just that inch too close to the art, all you would hear is "nitrogai," guy," <laughs> right? Which for me, at least at the time, was absolutely terrifying, right? And uh, um, in Russian, "nitrogai" guy" means "don't touch," so. Uh, you know, this, this person has one job, and one job only, and that job, her job is to keep the art room in her particular room safe. Okay, now if there's a threat that's larger, you know, if somebody doesn't listen when she tells them not to touch, right, or if there's a, a threat that's raging through multiple rooms, then the option is to call for help, and she carries a panic button on a lanyard. Right? And so if Mitra guy does not work, then you press the button and the, you know, the, the big dudes in the black jackets with the earpieces will converge and take care of the problem. Okay? So to me, this is very, very much like modern access management. Okay? When you're looking at it from that point of one room or one resource, you know, there are very specific things you have to do to be able to enforce. I want to talk about those things now. All right, so two functions, I believe, in access control today. First is recognize, right? You have to have some kind of threshold to understand when a, th when a thing is about to go wrong. How do you know what's important? And in access management, um, when you recognize something has changed, um, you, you have to interrupt the user, right? So in theory, you've authenticated the user. For example, 
the user is happily accessing content, and something happens, and suddenly you have to decide whether you're going to take the user down a different path from the happy path of simply allowing them to have whatever they want. Okay, so that question of how do you know when to interrupt the user? What are, what are your tools for discovering uh, you know, abuse or discovering, you know, it could be a good reason, it could be a bad reason, okay? But you gotta first decide how to recognize. Once you've recognized that a thing has changed, then you have to decide how to act. And so if you're gonna enforce uh, based on a recognition of a problem, you have you know, some simple options. Um, in this case, if you take that museum analogy, it could be that the person who's reaching for the art is the curator of the museum. And they may have credentials that prove they're the curator of the museum. And in that case, even though you've seen something that's, that's worrisome in some way, you're still gonna allow them access, right? Oh, it's okay, it's the curator, go right ahead, right? You're gonna stand down as the enforcer. Okay, it may be, however, that the museum curator is entitled but doesn't have their credentials with them, right? So you see somebody reaching, you, you tell them not to touch, and they say, oh, I, you know, here's my excuse. Well, what you wanna do is redirect them. You wanna helpfully make them successful, right? By saying, please just walk down to the office, grab a, a temporary credential and come right back and then I'll be happy to let you touch this artwork, right? Now it may be that the right thing to do is to de deny them access, but that may not be a bad thing, right? So it may be that in fact this person was, you know, um, you know in, in, uh, maybe they clicked the sign out button, right? They've indicated that they want to stop receiving uh, access to a resource. Well, that's an example where you want to deny service at the request of the person who has uh, initiated the activity, right? So in that case, you might want to just, you know, place, give them a nice thank you for coming to our website type of message. And then the last one is alarming. So it might be that you're gonna take a written enforcement action and that it's not enough for your action to just stay in the room. You need to do, you know, follow on activities. So you need to uh, kick off a workflow or you need to, uh, you know, in some other way, um, you know, call in, call in the men in black, whatever those things are. So, the, you know, the alarming idea is that you are now feeding signal into some other activity, right, that's going to create a bigger and wider response. All right, so let's talk about this in real identity management terms, right, if you talk about federation and SSO. Um, and, you know, the redirect is pretty obvious in a lot of ways, right? If you show up in a brand new browser at, say, salesforce.com, Salesforce will helpfully redirect you to your home, you know, to your enterprise so that you can authenticate. Perfect, right? Um, it could be that um, you, uh, you know, you have a, an expired identity provider session, right? So there might be a follow-on redirect that takes you back to, you know, to do some proofing, right? Could take you into a workflow, right? The ejection use case is really that sign out, right? Please, please do a thing because I've asked you to. Take me out of this this user context. Um, alarming is an in the interesting one there is that when you sign out, that may have implications in a greater context, such as single logout, right? So not only do you wanna kill that one session context, but you wanna initiate a single login process, meaning you may have to contact your identity provider so that it can do all the follow on ripple effect actions. All right, so that was, so when we talk about web servers, we have some technical options for, for mechanisms, right? We have SAML. SAML is old, right? It's old but great. It's an oldie but good, goodie, if you will. What, you know, there was no real concept of, of all of those enforcement actions back then. The only event, you know, the only thing that could trigger a change in state really was a logout. So they have this concept of single logout, but the problem with SAML single logout is that uh, what happens is the identity provider has to track all the different relying parties that you've federated to. And what happens when you hit single logout is then it just tries to contact every single one. Now you may have closed tabs, you may have gone out of those different paradigms and it only has the web to, um, to work with, the front channel, right? So it tries to redirect you to relying party one. And then and says, oh, yes, it's done, it's logged out. How about relying party two? Let's redirect you there. Oh, hi. Oh, well, great. And then what about relying party three? Oh, well, you ended relying party three, right? So meanwhile, the user is sitting in front of a browser, 
waiting, right? Waiting for these redirections to all these websites that may or may not even succeed. So SAML single logout is poorly adopted. And this is the reason why, right? It's not 100% effective. So Open Identity Connect, right, with many things, Open Identity Connect has tried to improve on this. And they have created both what they call a front channel and a back channel logout spec. So now what that means is that we, we may try to communicate that a logout, logout signal has been received either through, say, an iframe embedded in the website or through a back channel service that you can uh, you know, receive uh, information on. Um, but it's an implementer's draft right now. So that is not well adopted today either because it's uh, still gaining implementer feedback. If you're interested in that, you should go to check out the spec at openid.net and give some feedback. All right, so now the web stuff has been around for a long time, as I said. Uh, the, the API world is much uh, newer in a lot of ways. And so if you have uh, an OAuth resource service, otherwise known as an API, um, you don't have the same tools at your command because your user is not present. You don't have any front channel there to do things like redirect the user to a helpful location. All you can do is give an error. And the important thing with an API is you have to give a good enough error that the client that you're error erroring out to knows what to do. So for example, if I, if I have a mobile app and my mobile app is calling your calendaring API, then the calendaring API can, you know, has a few knobs it can twist to try to convince the client that it should go back and get another token or that you know, maybe the server's completely down, right? Everything's foobar and there's actually no point in even trying to go get another token, right? That, those interactions of, of explanation and action are much less um, explored in APIs. Uh, the, now, the, the one exception here, by the way, is UMA, the UMA OAuth grant. The UMA OAuth grant actually creates a way for resources to specify, you know, to, to say no to an access for request and then explain why and where you could go to fix the problem. So it, it might be useful for you to look at that OAuth, the OAuth, um, UMA OAuth grant. Great. So those were two federated, you know, federated-ish resources. But what about everything else? Right? How do you get your MDM to stop working? How do you get your CASB to stop working because your device went out of compliance in your MDM? Anyone? Yeah, it's a problem, right? Because all of these different security paradigms have grown up in silos. So the MDM, you know, you can have a ton of, um, of uh, enforcement in the MDM world. It just doesn't leave the MDM world. You can have a ton of enforcement in the CASB world doesn't leave the CASB world. So we have an issue right now where we have these silos and events are occurring in the silos and we would like to have ripple effects occur across our entire system and it's hard to do right now. Um, a lot of, some of these products do have it. They tend to be API based and they tend to be proprietary. So if you wanna go do an integration, great. Chances are the only one that's gonna be plug and play is gonna be with a uh, seam system. And the problem with seam systems is there's no real time sense there, right? You have, um, you know, you're writing to a log file. And the question is, when does it show up in your logs? And, and what kind of latency do you end up with, right? It's not a signaling system. It's a logging system. All right. So what I'm really saying is enforcement, you know, for all the years we've been working on it, it just doesn't do the trick right now. That's the problem. So we're gonna change gears now and we're gonna go back to the recognition side, right? Talk about that. Uh, how do you know when things are going sideways? That is the question. Well, the first thing you have to do is recognize that some events are ordinary and some events are extraordinary. So if you take a look at, you know, there, there's really four ways that, uh, you know, your state changes, right? If you think of the state of a user, okay, this the the, Ability for a user to access resources will change based on what the user does. Do they, you know, do they initiate logout? It changes based on uh, how your environment changes. Did they just walk out of your corporate building and therefore they've left the protected IP space, right? So that's something that, that the, it, where the environment changes. Um, the administrative changes, of course, so you may literally enact a policy. And so your user experience may change 
on you know, uh, hour one versus hour two because you've changed their policies. Um, and then, of course, the last one is attacker activity. So it may be that your password has just been reset without your knowledge. It may be that, that you have a rippling account takeover attack, right, where they've compromised your Yahoo, and then they compromise your Apple, and they use that to compromise your bank. So all of these are examples of things that are really useful for us in this audience to know and to possibly react to. But some of these happen more frequently than others. And some of them have greater risk attached than others. And that's where it gets sort of uh, interesting and questionable. Do you use the same system to communicate that the user has left the corporate IP space as you do to, to say the users had their account taken over? Maybe. Uh, you know, there's a big difference in, in uh, scale there, right? How many people every day leave the corporate space? Well, it probably everyone leaves the corporate space during, the, you know, during a day, uh, compared to account takeovers, which are infrequent but really important. All right, so we're going to go back and we'll go through the federation world. Um, federation has always relied on stateless interactions. And now those stateless interactions are sometimes um, abused. However, um, it's, the system still works. So generally speaking, the best practices today are to have access tokens, uh, sorry, to have ID tokens that set up sessions. And when you calculate your risk, your risk is based on how long that session is. Right? And um, the way federation works, in case you're not familiar with it, is it's a secure introduction between your identity provider and your relying party. And those introductions happen, um, they happen one time when the um, session gets established. And then what happens is you work in your relying party. You work in the session context of your relying party. That session expires. And the relying party says, oh, I don't know who you are anymore. I'm going to go ask who you are and send you back to the identity provider. So what you have is this bounce that happens between your identity provider and your relying party. And the frequency of that bounce di you know, dictates your risk. So if you have just created a new session in, say, Salesforce, right, when you know, something horrific happens at your identity provider, let's say, let's say your account gets taken over 10 minutes after you create your Salesforce session. Well, we can kill things at your identity provider, but your Salesforce session is still open. Or let's say your laptop gets stolen, right? Somebody literally picks it up off the cafe uh, table while it's still authenticated and still logged in. You didn't lock your screen, right? So that access to Salesforce, even though you know that laptop's stolen, the access to Salesforce is going to stick around until that session uh, expires, right? And that's a problem for us as breaches get tougher and as we are trying to close all the holes for security, right? OK, now let's talk about the APIs again, recognition. How does, an, how does an API know that something's happened that it needs to act upon? Well, we have the same paradigm in general. We have the concept of access token expiry. So in OAuth, you actually have two mechanisms for your feedback loop. Okay, When your access token expires, you can try to use the back channel to get a new one. And that's called token refresh. If your access token expires and refresh doesn't work, then you have to open a browser and you have to get the user to authenticate again. So this, again, it's bouncing, right? You're opening a browser and, and you're checking things out or you're calling an endpoint. Every time you call the refresh token endpoint, it is an opportunity for your identity provider or your authorization service, as OAuth is, uh, uses, the term OAuth uses, to say no. So you can have the identity provider decide that, the, that, this, that no more access should be given every time you're calling home. Okay? So the real question is, what kind of token do you have? If you have a token that is self-sufficient, meaning that it's a JOT, for example, a JSON web token, then you don't have to call home very often, if ever. And it is designed that way for performance reasons. So if you're going to issue millions and millions and billions of access tokens, you may not want a billion calls home over the use of a billion access tokens, because they're happening all the time, right? Every API call that you make with an access token, you're submitting an access token to your API. Um, there is one alternative to this, and that is token introspection. That's RFC 7662. Token introspection is great, right? You literally, you know, as an API, you receive an access token, and you want to look it up. You just hand it over to the endpoint and say, is it good? Do I like it? Is it good? Right? And, and the token introspection endpoint will take care of it for you. This is super useful. Um, 
the other area that sort of impinges on this is threat intelligence. They're, the security world is already interested in events like account takeovers. So they've developed a bunch of stuff. They have a, a specification called uh, Taxi, and they have a, um, an event format called Sticks. You can look up Taxi and Sticks, right? It's, I mean, it's made for global uh, security enforcement. And if you think about this, your SOC, they have a whole different set of act actions, right? It's not the same as an app. They may want to decide to bring in lawyers. They may, may want to decide to fire somebody because of, of a signal that they've received about an, you know, an event that's occurred. So the, signal, the security world is really big, but it is starting to merge, I believe, with the identity world. All right, so I got like four minutes left. I want to talk about where we are now. Today, there is a working group in the OpenID Foundation called RISC, R-A-S-C. Okay, RISC is about extraordinary events, right? Uh, people have spent four years working to figure out how you could communicate, uh, safely communicate events about account disablements or about uh, you know, password events, things that are a big deal. So it is designed for extraordinary events to be passed between domains. They have a, a um, essentially what happens is the receiver of an event will uh, volunteer for, to receive signals about a certain user. Okay, so it's meant to be privacy preserving and it's meant to occur, but it's really meant to be a corporation to corporation pipeline, right? It's not meant to be installed on every single federated relying party and every single API out there, okay? That's risk. Now, CAPE is something new. If you haven't heard of CAPE, uh, CAPE is Continuous Access Evaluation Protocol, and it, you know, it's quite, uh, it's still emerging, but we believe that perhaps what CAPE can be is a, an analogous procedure whereby we can communicate ordinary events. So you can imagine the differences in what this service has to be. You may, it may still be pub sub, but now there's gonna be way more traffic, first of all. High, high, high performance. Um, but the other thing is we don't necessarily want, you know, you don't really want your, every single API out there to have to know, oh, they left, they left the, you know, the corporate perimeter and oh, now they changed their password and oh, now this happened and that happened. So you know, where we see CAPE is possibly going is this idea that all we say is the user's state has changed, right? Something has happened, go check in, right? And use whatever method you want to check in. So you could use token introspection, right? Once you know that the session state has changed, you can use token introspection to call back and say, is the token still active? Right? You, can, uh, you can, I don't know, make a phone call if you absolutely want to. Right? There's no limit to how, what the mechanisms are once you've recognized that there's a small problem and it's important that you know it's a small problem. Then you have these options to, to, to do things like reauthentication. Right? We don't want reauthentication to be a big deal. We want it to be super simple. You, you know, a thing has changed, oh, just check that it's you. Things changed, oh, check that it's you. That's what we're kind of going for. All right, so ultimately from a recognition point of view, we're way better off. We're at the start line, right? We already have uh, a, a, uh, an example in risk, how risk can help us. We're looking at possibly CAPE to fill this gap of these ordinary events, right? So where I think this might go is this concept of selective introspection. The problem with um, having you know, tokens and sessions that are short-lived and expire all the time is it's very expensive, right? Because you're constantly pounding, you're forcing a lot of issuance of tokens all the time. Now, if we can get to the point where CAPE can you know, performantly say, hey, call home, and think something like token introspection can say, yeah, that's an inactive token, right? So you know, some people will find that the token's inactive, some people will find it's active. Now we've got something, right? Now you only have um, these calls home in cases where they're really warranted. And what we're hoping is that we can tune that to make it useful for everybody. All right, so what does this all mean? Well, it means that it's about to get fun. If this is your bag, then you should come talk to me and we can, you know, CAPE is, uh, doesn't have a home in the standards world yet, uh, but it has a strong affinity with risk. So it's possible it may go there. We're really uh, starting to work out what's important to us. What are the considerations? And if you want to be involved in that process, now is the time. Uh, the other piece is, I believe that session management as a concept goes away. 
I think that we work towards continuous authentication and that continuous authentication becomes a blend of all the things I've talked about, right? The, the uh, expiry based kind of pummeling and the uh, event triggered introspection and the extraordinary events and the ordinary, ordinary events all together. So with that, I will leave. I, I don't know if I have time for questions. I think I might have time for one. Is that right? I don't know what time it is. Okay, we got one question. I'll, I'll repeat the question because I don't. I I can't run the mic. Also. <laughs> yep. Okay, so the question was, is there anything in SAML that's going on to sort of address some of these deficiencies in this protocol? The answer is no. The SAML has not changed in, I don't know, seven years, eight years? Where's Brian Campbell? He could probably answer this question. Um, there isn't. I mean, I, there are things wrong with SAML that I think that some people would like to get the band back together to try. But the truth is, um, you can do, there are ways you can get around it. Like, you can kill the cookie on the back end as long as you have the signals moving across. So I, I would guess that the specification is unlikely to change and that uh, there'll be compensation mechanisms that work around it. That would be my answer. All right, I better let you all go. You're probably hot as heck. So thank you, everyone. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you.